All right. Hey, guys. Welcome once again to live streaming here on the RDP YouTube channel. As always, Match for Lee here. And I wanted to take the opportunity here to live stream a pretty potent lesson that I've recently been starting to understand in more in depth as I'm researching uh, not my next book, that's the one on micro workouts, but my next next book. Uh, that's the one that's going to be the sequel to Fitness Independence. And what that's about is like the original Fitness Independence is getting super, super deep into what actually makes fitness work. Why does it work? Because I don't know about you, but I've long become very frustrated with the idea that what we're doing isn't working very well. When you look at the fact that a lot of people who start workouts and start diets and stuff don't get the results they want, it's clear to me that what we're trying to do isn't working that well. And what I'm discovering, as I did in the first book, is that when you really get deep down into the fundamental principles of what govern our body and what it changes and stuff, a lot of the stuff that we do put our attention towards, things like macronutrient ratios, sets and reps and stuff, that stuff isn't unimportant, but it's not that important. And the stuff that's really important is stuff we're largely not even paying that much attention to. How's it going, Goris from? Always good to see you, my friend. Oh, everybody coming in. Max, hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Everybody's coming on in. Fantastic. So uh, the lesson that I wanted to share is the importance of emotional alignment with what we're doing. Essentially, here's the, the thing I really want to drive home and like put this on like a bumper sticker, is nothing changes until you feel differently about things. That whole Apple ad, right? Think different. Well, thinking different is fine, but feeling different is where the real game-changing episodes are. And looking back on my own life, I can now look and see in you know hindsight's 2020 that oh my gosh, like every time I've had breakthroughs, every time I've hit some sort of a major shift in my approach to exercise and diet and exercise and um, fitness in general, it's never been because I've learned something. It's always been because how I feel about something changes, how I feel about food, how I feel about a type of exercise, how I feel about Taekwondo. When I was younger, I didn't like Taekwondo. I didn't like going to it. I didn't like uh, going to class. I'd go through the motions and stuff. And eventually I kind of hit a shift and suddenly I was like obsessed with it and I got a lot faster in my progress and everything changed entirely because of how I felt about what I was doing. So the lesson for you today is if you really want to make a big shift happen, and if, especially if you keep learning things, but you're never really applying or getting much out of all the books you're reading and all the YouTube videos you're watching and stuff, if that's not making a major change, then we need to look at how you feel about things. And I, full honesty, I don't know where to really go with that. It's like, okay, so how do you feel differently about stuff? How do you feel different? But I will tell you this, is that from now on out, the focus of me making my videos is going to be not so much how can I teach people things, but how can I get you to feel differently about stuff? How can I get you to feel differently about overcoming isometrics? Because if I can get you to kind of shift your emotional base just a little bit, that's where I can make the biggest impact for you. So there's a heads up for you. Let's see if we can't get to some of these questions and uh, and stuff. Remy, hey, it's good to see you. Omar, what's up? All right, everybody, come on on in. Mindset is a key. Yes, Michael. Although I, I agree with uh, one of the gurus that I like to follow, Robin Sharma. Uh, he always said there's mindset, but then there's heart set. And I think he's absolutely right because mind and heart are – they're so interrelated, but they are different because you can think and learn a million things here and change your mindset. Like I can teach you everything in the world to know about donuts. So you can know all there is to about, know about donuts and you can be educated about donuts and stuff. But when someone comes into work one day and they bring in a dozen donuts, how you feel about seeing those donuts will dictate your actions on those donuts, whether you avoid them or eat half a dozen or whatever. It's the heart set and the mindset that's super important. Can you hear my kitty cat? Yes, yes, Scott. So case in point, like cats, like I've always loved cats, so I have a couple of cats. I know some people, they don't like cats because they, they just, 
they don't feel the same way I do about cats. So they'll never have a cat. And it's because of how they feel about the cat uh, that dictates whether or not they're going to have them or whether or not they want to foster cats and things like that. Uh, so rehab exercises, let's get to some questions here. Getting on. Let's talk rehab exercises for tennis elbow. Uh, tennis elbow, golfer's elbow and stuff, tendinosis, not quite tendinitis, that's a little more severe. Tendinosis is usually what people have. Um, rehab exercise, it depends on what's actually causing it. When we have stress in a tendon, it usually means a muscle somewhere isn't doing its job. Now, a lot of times that's a back muscle. Um, it's something that is bigger bigger muscle not turning on because that small little areas are getting overly stressed because big muscles aren't doing their job. So it's lats, it's traps, uh, could be something in the shoulder that's creating some instability. These sorts of things are usually best with hands-on diagnosis so you know exactly what's causing it because otherwise I'm just guessing. It's just a random guess. Like I might as well just flip a coin and be like, oh, your lats aren't engaged. Try that kind of thing. But do keep in mind that that stuff takes forever to heal uh, after speaking, I've had it myself. But um, I really do think that overcoming isometrics, I know I'm all about that these days and stuff. I hate to keep bringing it up like a broken record, but that may be a good place to start. Uh, so like an isometric row is where I would uh, start folks with uh, for that. Maybe that'll help. Maybe it won't. I don't know, but uh, it's probably going to be something about strengthening a muscle that's not quite turning on. Uh, let's see, other other questions. Keep them coming. Every. Exercises for a broken heart. Well, you know, one of the, I know it's, you may be half joking with this, but you know, one of the things that I find has been very helpful for me, because I, in the past, if something bad happened, like girlfriend broke up with me or something like that, I would just, I mean, it just wrecked me for months on end. I mean, you want to talk about bleeding heart, like I'm it, right? And, you know, a good case in point, this past weekend, I got some pretty sad news on my personal life, which is I learned that the Taekwondo school that I had been working with since I was, I, I mean, I've been studying this guy since I was 10, uh, it closed down, you know, partially due to coronavirus and stuff. So when we look at the past, we often nostalgize things. We take out the bad and we bring and we overemphasize the good. Now, Taekwondo totally changed my life. And that school is like a second home to me. And the instructors there are like family. However, one of the things that can bring us some balance, if we're really feeling negative about a past situation, is to balance it out with, yeah, but think of some of the things that weren't so good. You know, it doesn't mean the bad the good stuff wasn't bad. Don't try to erase it. You want to hold on to good things. But balance it out, because especially with nostalgia, we tend to get lopsided. Like, oh, man, I remember in my high school days, this thing was great. And what you can do is take a moment and just think, yeah, well, think of a couple things that happened at the same time that weren't so good in high school, that didn't make it the best of times. And what that does is it brings us a little bit more of an emotional balance with remembering those circumstances. So we keep the good, but we keep it in check. And that helps to some degree because yes, I love Taekwondo. I love going to that school, but to be perfectly honest, there were long stretches of time when it wasn't the place where I wanted to be. There were some dark periods in my life that I was going through that I loved going there, but it wasn't all fun and games. So by remembering those things, we get more of a realistic bead on what it was in our lives. And that way we can treasure the special things and learn from the things that weren't so good. So there's my two cents on that. Um, let's see, uh, Gideon, here we go. Next question. Body weight squats with 15 second ISO hold every five or so reps build muscle. Damn if I know. <laughs> who knows, who knows? Now this is good because I get a lot of questions like this where people will say, if I do this exercise this way, or if I do this many reps or something, will that build muscle? And the answer is it's impossible to say, because always remember that your progress and the results you're looking for do not come from the formula you follow. And I know that sounds weird because we're always told, oh, do these many reps to build muscle, follow this diet or whatever, right? But in fact, your results come from progression of what you can do now. So if you did that formula, and that formula said, oh, wow, this is making my legs step up and work harder than they're used to doing, then yes, that can definitely help. 
But if you took that same formula and applied it to someone who would do that not even in a warm up, no, it wouldn't help. So it's all relative to what, what you're starting off with. That's why you want to start off with a consistent habit and build off of whatever you can do. But you're not going to find the results you want from some sort of secret formula or rep scheme or anything like that. It's going to be what can you do now and how are you going to progress it over time? That's what's ultimately going to build muscle for you. So good question. Very, very good question. Let's see. Next one here. Um, do the same principles for grease the groove work for vertical and speed training? It can, but keep in mind that speed training is very neural intensive. It's very intense as far as a lot of output, very quick. Uh, ch uh, check out Explosive Calisthenics, uh, aka Convict Conditioning 3 uh, from Dragon Door, where Paul Wade does an amazing job of talking about how to really develop effective speed because. A lot of times, like jumping up and down on a box a million times isn't necessarily the best way to build that pop or that speed. Instead, you want to do things that are very explosive, maximum effort. So think of like max lift, like a max lift bench press or deadlift, right? If you grease the groove with that, eventually your output goes down, 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 and you're not able to get as much into it. So apply the same thing with speed training. Keep the volume low, keep the frequency low, and apply the frequency as much as you like as long as you can keep that max output going. But as soon as you feel like you're not able to put 100% into every repetition, uh, then it's a good place to cut it off. You're not trying to exhaust yourself, you're trying to just develop that quick fire, uh, which is different than building muscle, excuse me. Spring water, love me my spring water. Let's see, what else have we got here? <clears throat> bench press or push-ups, the classic conundrum. And uh, to be honest with you, I don't think it really matters unless, again, it matters to you. Uh, it's kind of like saying Harley Davidson or Suzuki motorcycle. Uh, what do you like? <laughs> what do you prefer? Always remember that your results do not depend on the method you use. You know, does the bench press build more muscle and strength than push-ups and so on? It depends on you. It depends on your proficiency. It depends on how good you are at the bench press and how well you know how to apply it. Depends on how good you are at push-ups and how you know to apply it. So really, we're talking about preference of various vehicles. What do you like? What do you prefer? Just go with that and aim for progression and proficiency in the discipline to maximize your results. Um, let's see. Walt, talking about kyphosis. Yes, did you switch to bodyweight training, balance things out? I adopted your overhead stretch to help with mine. Uh, yeah, body weight helped, but it really it didn't depend too much on the body weight training so much as it is just I learned to engage my back muscles to a larger degree, particularly my lats and my erectors. Now, I was able to do that well with body weight training and stuff over time. Grind style calisthenics gave me more tension control, so that really helped, but it also became much more of an awareness of how I was using my back with all exercises, uh, like hanging leg raises, push-ups, especially dips and stuff, keeping my shoulders back. Being aware of habitual tension patterns, like hunched up shoulders and stuff, is part of the key because you can do all the exercises in the world. And like, I'm doing rows, I'm doing rows, I'm doing rows. But if you keep using your, your shoulders the same way, you're sitting at your desk the same way and stuff, it's not really going to do a whole lot for you. So being aware of how you're using those muscles and then applying it throughout the day and throughout your workouts is really the key to helping to balance those sorts of things out. Uh, let's see. Uh, it, it's weird, like I click on these things in order to show the question, and half the time I cursor over it, and right before I click it, I get <laughs> someone else goes right there. I'm trying to click here. There we go, Nordic curl, more hip or knee dominant, it's knee dominant. Uh, that's where you're primarily uh, working from, which is Nothing wrong with that, but it's one of the reasons why I've always preferred the suspension style hamstring curl because it's a little more hip dominant or a little more hip emphasis as well as all of the other muscles in the posterior chain as well as flexing the knee. So I just feel like it's a more progressive, it's easier to adjust, it's easier on the knees, it's more uh, variable. People tend to have a better time with it. It teaches your hamstrings to work with your entire posterior chain. Not that the Nordic curl doesn't, but I don't think it does quite as well of a job of it. So 
those are reasons and more why uh, I don't think it, anything wrong with the Nordic curl. I just think suspension uh, curls are probably going to be better bang for uh, the buck. All right. Uh, here we go. Uh, tips for stretching the Achilles heel area. Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> um, tendons and ligaments are not meant to be stretched. They're very tough. They're very fibrous and they damage quickly if you are really trying to uh, trying to mobilize them. The IT band, people are like, oh my God, my IT bands are tight. Your tendons and ligaments are supposed to be tight. They're holding you together, uh, especially your ligaments. They're literally holding your bones together. They are supposed to be tight. You want them to be tight. You always want them to be tight. When you feel stress in tendons and ligaments, it's because the muscles associated with them are not shock absorbing as they were. It's like shock absorbers in a car. They're the ones that are supposed to be absorbing your shock. And if they're worn out or they're not handling the shock very well, usually because they're fairly uh, weak or an associated muscle is weak and it's getting tight because it's so strong, then you have a problem and stretching it out is not going to help. That's why I tell people if they're rolling out like their IT bands and stuff, it's like, if you're rolling out your IT bands for the next several weeks or so, it's not working. Like it, no one has tidy IT bands because of lack of foam rolling. I've never had trouble with my IT bands. I've never done any foam rolling on my legs. So you want to look at what are the muscles associated with that, particularly calves, hamstrings, posterior chain. You're working on your bridges there, Michael. So that's a good place to start. That's the stuff that will take the stress out of those tendons and the ligaments and put it in the muscle where it's supposed to be. Um, James, hey James, good to talk to you, man. Pros and cons of yielding versus overcoming isometrics. Great question. Absolutely. Let me drink. So yielding isometrics are where you have a set resistance that you're holding in place. Think of like holding a dumbbell out to your side, a 20-pound dumbbell. That's your resistance. And you're creating the amount of tension in the muscles to maintain that position. Now, the pro on that is it's somewhat quantifiable because I've have so much weight on the end of my arm. If it's more weight, great, more resistance. The negative to that is that you can only hold it for so long and your technique could be compromised. So, you know, if I'm holding like this and over time, I'm kind of like, I'm still holding it up. I'm still holding it up. I'm, you know, we've seen this all the time where people are like, I'm going to hold a plank for five minutes. And after the third minute, they're sagging and they're drooping down and everything. And it's like, I'm still holding it. Yeah. Well, your technique is crap, <laughs> but yes, you're still holding it. The goal is to not hold it. The goal is to create that tension. So you've got quantifiable metrics, but uh, quality control and uh, is an issue with yielding. Plus, you only need the amount of tension in your muscles to get that technique done. Now, yield, uh, excuse me, overcoming isometrics, harder to quantify, which is one of the reasons why Dragon Door's ISO chain is looking to solve that. We'll see if it does. Hopefully that'll be out fairly soon. Um, but one of the great things about overcoming is that you don't have to really maintain a technique. It's like you get locked in because there's nothing pulling you out of alignment and it's max tension. It's 100% as hard as you can go for as long as possible. So when you're looking at maximizing time under tension, it's one of the best methods you possibly can because you've got max tension for max time uh, and you don't necessarily have the technical erosion because as your muscles get tired, uh, you just pull on the strap or the iso chain or whatever less. It doesn't really compromise technique. So there's your there's your pros and cons. Hopefully, uh, James, that makes uh, some sense there. Uh, Mohammed, what do you think of farmer's walk exercise for strength gains? Now I love carries largely because they are an over uh, they are an isometric exercise largely. Uh, your forearms, your grip, your biceps, your back everything's working for them. I love carries. I think they're fantastic. Um, they need to be done well. They're, they're one of those exercises that is so simple that a lot of people, they'll just grab a couple of kettlebells and they'll just walk and they're like, okay, it's just walking. That's all it is. There is a technique to it. There is technical skill involved in a farmer's carry. Just ask a strong man or something. They need to learn how to do it safely especially when you talk about very heavy poundages, but is fantastic exercise, probably one of the best weight exercises bar none. If you're going to do any kind of weight training, a lot of people are like deadlifts are the most functional. I beg to differ. 
I used to work in a place that sold fitness equipment and I was delivering fitness equipment. We used to hire guys out of the gyms all the time and sure they could lift up the treadmill, but when it came time to walking it around their house and up the flight of stairs and stuff, couldn't do it worth beans. So we spend much less time lifting objects and much more time carrying objects. Cause think about it in the real world, you never lift up a sack of groceries to put it right back down again. We almost always lift stuff up to carry it. So carries are extremely practical and functional. Highly recommend if you're doing some sort of, of a weight training. All right. Hey Lee, how's it going? Good to have you on here, man. Hope everybody caught our chat the other day. Uh, Lee, uh, I think, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Lee, but I think you put a review of the Kinsui Easy Vest up too. Uh, so a lot of people have been asking me for that. So everybody check out Lee's channel and uh, see if he's got the review there. And uh, you can learn more about the Kinsui Easy Plate Loader Weight Vest. Best weight vest out there, bar none. Greg, <laughs> Greg saying, love your channel, silent listener. Thank you very much, Greg. Appreciate it. Appreciate the support big time. Uh, let's see what other questions we got. So again, we're trying to get to a different place on how we feel about things. And I think it's, I mean, I hate to bring up current events and everything, but I think it's, it's interesting to see this stuff happening in real time with everything we've got going on in society these days, especially here in America, we've got coronavirus, we got the Floyd uh, protests and everything like that. It's really a firsthand account of how much our emotional state dictates the behavior of the masses, how people react to things. We're not doing this all on a logical level. We're doing it very much emotionally. And especially now here in the States, we have an election year coming up. And of course, all the ads and stuff are all about being manipulative on an emotional level. And advertisers figured this stuff out years ago. Uh, there was a, a good comparison. I was reading a marketing book about the power of emotional advertising versus logic advertising. They were saying that at the time, or at least when the book was published, that over in Europe, they couldn't sell diamond jewelry to save their life. They just could not sell it, no matter how much they advertised because they kept trying to advertise to this. They're like, this is the carrots and this is the science behind our cut and how the light reflects off the stones. And they were going after a logical sell and nobody could care less. It's like, it's a rock, big deal. But here in the States, Every holiday, it's like De Beers comes out with the most emotionally grabbing ads, and it says nothing about the stones. All it does is it shows like some pretty successful woman opening up a box and being like, oh my God, like diamonds, oh my God. And boom, guys are like lining up with their credit cards going, I need diamonds, I need diamonds, I want to make my woman that happy on Christmas morning. When we can tap into an emotional desire. That's when it's easiest to get people to do what you want. And advertisers and the news and the media are masters at this. They are so incredibly good at this. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because you can manipulate people emotionally to do good, good stuff, right? But the, the, one of the things that I've noticed personally for me that kind of puts my red flags up is beware of any sort of messages out there that try to manipulate you to be emotionally against something. Personally, that's the stance I've taken. Any sort of message out there that says against this, against this kind of people, against this kind of exercise, against this kind of program, against this kind of diet, against, 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 that's usually the stuff that's not the most productive. And it's usually trying to get you to go into a certain camp for someone else's benefit. It doesn't even matter if it is truly something to go against, like against Nazi Germany or whatever, right? But if you're against something, you're playing to someone else's preferences. So my attitude has always been, no, okay, maybe not for that, but what can I build that's above that? So instead of saying I'm against racism, I'm all like, I'm for equality. Like what can we do to foster understanding? What can we do to foster connections between people? What can we do to build understanding and connections with people because the best tool the greatest tool that we have at our disposal for eliminating something we don't like is obsolescence anything in our society that has disappeared or greatly shrunk down over time has never disappeared or shrunk because someone was against it 
It's because someone said, yeah, that's, that's there, but I've got something better. I've got something greater. I've got something that's faster, cheaper, more effective. And people put their resources towards that thing and it starves the other thing. So when we go against something, we're oftentimes adding fuel to a fire. And I know I'm kind of just getting off topic here, but when it comes to fitness, don't fight, build. Build something better. Okay, I'm against like restrictive diets. Okay, great. There was a time I was against restrictive diets. And nowadays I'm trying to be more of like, I don't care about restrictive diets. It's just healthy eating with the aid, with the aim to satisfy your appetites. I'm not against paleo and everything like that, like I used to be, but I've, I find that healthy eating strategies are just so much better. They're so much easier. They're so much more effective. They're so much more potent and healthier and more powerful. And so that's what I've put my attention towards. And when you can bring more attention towards good things, the bad stuff just kind of shrivels up and fades away because you're not giving attention. Because the worst thing we can do towards bad things is give them more attention because usually they've risen up because we were giving them some sort of attention. Hey, Leo, greetings from Argentina, greetings from America, man. Good to have you on here. Uh, but ultimately, it's about putting you in control, putting you in a state of independence. I've always talked about fitness independence. And one of the other lessons that I've learned from researching the sequel to fitness independence is that a lot of times a dogmatic view will tell you that in order to be free, you need to have control. You need to have control of something bad. You need to have control of your appetites, control of your desires, control of another race of people or control of a group of people or control of the government or whatever it is. But the fact is, the more we try to go for control, the less control we actually have because someone else is usually telling us we need to follow their rules rather than making our own versus independence means instead of seeking control, we seek choice. We seek situations where we give ourselves permission to make our own choices. So instead of saying, I need to control junk food, let's give you the tools to make sound choices with junk food. So when is a couple of Oreo cookies a good choice for you? When is having pizza night a good choice? If you can make your choices, then you're more in control of your own actions and your thoughts, rather than trying to conform to some sort of a dogmatic approach that's usually handed down from some guru. And you'll also notice that a lot of dogmatic approaches will probably be pointing the finger at you and saying, you're part of the problem. Your appetites are the problem, mother nature is the problem, human nature is the problem, this other group of people is the problem, someone else is the problem. That removes your independence and the ability to make personalized choices. And when you lose that, you're losing your freedom even if you're going after the pursuit of believing if I can just get control and conform to this type of thinking or approach or whatever, that'll eventually work out in the end. But the problem with trying to conform to a dogma is that success is always on the horizon. You're maybe getting closer to it, but you're never there. But when we accept independence and choice and realize that, okay, in this moment I can make a choice, then you have freedom immediately. It's not something down on the horizon. It's not something that will come once we finally achieve a utopia where everything is perfect. It's something that you can have now. And that's far more empowering uh, personally. Let's answer some more questions. Let's, let's see what we got here. Um, <clears throat> Gideon, how's it going? I do diamond push with my elbows. Does, hurt, no, does not hurt as soon as I use any other grip to my hands outwards, it pops and hurts. Little little confused on what you're saying you're getting, but kind of get what you're saying. Um, basically, again, I think it stems a lot from the back. A lot of the joints stress and stuff in the lower arm, the wrist, the elbow and stuff, stems from stability in the back, particularly the shoulder blade. So make sure that your lats are on. One of the tips that I've been implementing lately that has helped is when the hand is on the ground, imagine this part, right, on the bottom of the, the heel, imagine you're pulling that towards the bottom center of your sternum, so that you're trying to pull this way. That tends to bring a lot more stability into the arms, into the back, and it may help to bring some better alignment into those joints. So maybe, maybe that will help. 
hopefully that will be the case. Assuming again, no, no such uh, things when it comes to uh, 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 injuries and stuff. Hopefully nothing's st uh, structurally wrong there. Uh, so uh, Greg, thanks very much. Overcoming Isometrics book, yep, came out last week. Strap works, order in the queue. Fantastic, Greg, good to take action. Awesome, because a lot of people, you know, they read books and it just, it's not self-help, it's shelf-help. It just sits on the shelf. So fantastic ISO sling in the mail. Very good, way to go, Greg, congratulations. Ah, India, Arun, very good, good to see you. Uh, so yeah, but like I was saying, emotional alignment, do things you enjoy. A lot of times when we lack motivation to do things, it's because we're trying to force ourselves to do something that we're not totally emotionally aligned with. And it could be as simple as, I don't like running, I'd rather go hiking. Well, then go hiking. Uh, or it could be something that's a little bit deeper. Lots of times when people have uh, trouble achieving a bigger goal, especially like weight loss, it's almost all emotional. It's almost always emotional. And the best test is, if you know what to do but you're not doing it, that has nothing to do with what you know. It's all how we feel about certain things, which I know is not the easy answer. I know that's not the simple answer, but it's at least potentially the more potent answer. I'll keep you up to date on more discoveries as I find them over time. Okay, last questions. All right, dips or overhead press? Vertical pushing exercise, but I'd like to know which one is more beneficial. Uh, it kind of depends. See, the overhead press and the dips are, are different enough that yes, they are the same tension chain, and yes, they do involve the same muscles largely, but they are different enough that you're going to be stimulating a bit of a different response. Uh, overhead press is probably best, of course, if you're looking for shoulder development, and if you are looking for the strength to manipulate external objects. Like if you're training because you have a job working in a warehouse and you're always putting things up over on a shelf, then yeah, overhead press is going to be your go-to. Uh, dips though, I've always found to be one of my favorites. Love dips. They're basically the squat of the upper body. They work everything. They work your back as well. And the overhead press should as well, of course. Uh, but I just find it's one of the most complete upper body exercises you can do. I did a bunch of them today on the new NOSC uh, twin trainers that I got. Fantastic. Love them. Uh, highly endorse them. And uh, it just, oh, they just feel so good. So, uh, oh, one, one more, why, why not? Lee, just because you're here, uh, do you prefer training at home or the gym? Has Corona made you change your mind? I train where I like to train. Um, the, there's some times when I've had friends who have a gym membership and they're like, got a guest pass at my gym, why don't you come along? And I'd be like, yay, because I like being in the gym. You know, I like being in the environment, even if I'm just using the pull-up bar and the dip bar and the floor, uh, it's not about the equipment for me, it's about the environment. You get me in a good environment that is really focused on hard work and progress, then that's a good place to be. And that's why a lot of people when they're training at home don't feel very comfortable training at home because they don't have a good environment where they feel strong. It's like, I don't feel strong doing dips next to the cat's litter box in the basement, right? So it's important to cultivate your training environment at home so you feel strong, so you feel focused, so it's something that is very, uh, it, it promotes a strong and focused workout. It's all here and here. You wanna feel good about where you're working out. When you come to your workout space, you wanna be like, I am home. I am in a place where I feel like I can be myself. And if you cultivate the gym, a park, basement, wherever, doesn't matter where it is, because at the end of the day, you know, dips are dips, pull-ups are pull-ups, but you want to feel as comfortable and focused as possible in those areas. All right. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, oh, come on. More questions. What? Come on. A little bit more. Now the questions are coming in fast and furious. I hate to leave people hanging and stuff. It's like a river coming in. It's, I just love doing this sort of thing, which is uh, why I appreciate everybody coming in. But JD, advice if body weight training for folks over 40? No, no advice whatsoever. <laughs> because my advice is always the same, is train according to your capabilities. I've trained people in their 50s who kick my ass, who are exceptional athletes and are bulletproof. I've trained teenagers who have shot knees, shot elbows, shot shoulders, and they can't even do a body weight squat. I never base anybody's training on their age. Instead, I base it on what can you do? 
what 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 kind of issues do we need to work around and i I'm not going to change a training program because someone's a certain age. Um, I was training a guy one time uh, where he was doing dips, and I was like, he got into it, and he's like, how many should I do? I'm like, uh, 12. And he's like, 12. You know, I'm 52, right? I'm like, and? So? <laughs> like, But he had that message in his mind of, oh, I feel this way about my age. Once again, it's all about emotion. He felt a certain way about his age. He felt a certain way about his body and stuff. I was like, I don't care what age you are. I gave you 12 because last week you did 10 and you said it was easy. So therefore, I give you 12. <laughs> Let's keep you moving forward, getting stronger and progressive. So roundabout way, JD, I'm saying start with what you can do now comfortably, build some consistency and momentum, and then progress it gently and whatever feels most comfortable for you. If you don't feel comfortable doing dips, don't do dips, do push-ups. If you love doing dips, do do dips. But feel your body out. Work with your body, not against it. Uh, let's see. There was a leg question in here. Ah, oh, one of leg questions are the best. Primitive lifting. Anything for the legs if you have knee tendonitis? Yes. <laughs> uh, Basically nothing. Um, oh, knee tendonitis is the worst. I've had knee tendonitis most of my life uh, up until several years ago. No, the overcoming isometrics, yet again, a very good solution for that. Uh, wall sits, probably one of your best ways to go. Get into a wall sit and then drive your heels right into the floor as hard as possible. That should be good for your knees. Of course, don't do anything that hurts. We always respect pain. And bridges, get those hamstrings on. The more the back of your legs work, the less the front of your knees have to sustain stress. And uh, boy, that, I wish I knew that. That's how I cured all of mine. But always remember, tendonitis takes forever to heal. So it's going to be a long road, my friend, unfortunately. But if you can uh, strengthen up the quads with the wall sits, get those hamstrings and glutes engaged, take the stress out of the front, you should be good to go. All right. Oh... Always, always love doing this. It takes so much, so much uh, energy. The time always goes by so, so fast. Um, let's see. There's one. I just lost it. Just lost it. Do, do, do. Pull up our... There we go. There it is. Gideon, always with the great questions. Uh, do you still believe in training to failure? High fatigue. I'm 15. And I do that. I could be overdoing it. Um, I, again, I find failure is just so subjective. Like a lot of people, they have the ability to train far beyond what they currently think. Because usually we stop a set because of how it makes us feel. Not even a mental breakdown, but we feel it's enough. We feel we get to an emotional point where we're like, that feels like it's good enough, and then we we typically stop, even though our muscles can keep on going. Um, so I'm still a big fan of just push it, just go as hard as possible, and really get what you can out of your workout. If you're putting in the energy, you might as well get what you can out of it, especially if your objective is physical conditioning, building muscle, and uh, strength to, to some degree there. Uh, but I will say this, when it comes to overdoing it, uh, a lot of times if you're overdoing it, what will end up happening is when you get to the next workout, then you can't quite do what you did before. And that's the thing you want to be looking for. It, some people have asked me with the three-minute uh, drill that I gave in one of my previous YouTube videos on micro workouts for building muscle, three-minute test. You set a timer, three minutes, how many reps can you do? A lot of people are saying, well, can I do it again during the day? Here's the rule that I've adopted because as some of you may know, I haven't been following any sort of workout routine for the past month or two uh, because my lifestyle is so crazy and hectic, it didn't make any sense. So I literally just do whatever the hell I feel like every single day. But here's the thing that I have been following is I will not work a tension chain or a muscle group until I feel I can progress it or at least do a pretty good job of trying to progress it. So I'm not doing push-ups and dips because it's day, uh, like chest day uh, or Tuesday or whatever. i like, okay, do I think I can bring the heat to my push-ups today? And sometimes that means I'm doing them almost every day. But like last week, for whatever reason, my shoulders were just kind of wonky and they were tired and they were shot. And I went like five days without any push work at all. I get down on the floor and like, oh, God, this does not feel good. Everything feels 
very off, very sore. I'm not going to have a good workout on this. Okay, no, no, cut it. No, nope, not going to happen. And the other day, it was like, okay, now I'm good. And bang, I smashed the hell out of that workout. Felt amazing progressions all over the place. So the rule of thumb I recommend is base your workouts and your recovery off of your ability to make progress in your workouts, not how you feel. If you, if you feel tired, exhausted, and you can't make progress, then yeah, you need more recovery. Uh, and I usually say less volume in that case. But if you are feeling good and ready to rock and roll, rock and roll. All right. My, Adim, love the hat, man. That's an awesome, awesome uh, avatar. Very good. How to gain strength without size. Stay away from the failure. High reps, or not high reps, excuse me, uh, high weight, low repetitions. So if you can do like six reps, do three and keep your muscles relatively fresh. That's what you're looking for is keep it short, keep it intense. You want to train your nervous system to produce a lot of force and rather than exhausting and fatiguing the muscles. Also on that one, uh, will overcoming isometrics increase size? They can. It's just like any other physical discipline. If you bring your muscles to expend a lot of energy, yes, they certainly can. In fact, I'm very much now aware of like every time I put overcoming isometrics as more of a regular part of my program, the compliments come out of the water. People are like, you look great, you look fit, you look toned, you look bigger. I get this all the time whenever I start taking overcoming isometrics more seriously. So they can certainly increase size and shape and building up your physique. Uh, but again, it's the same principle. If I didn't want the size, but I wanted the strength, I would hold for a very short period of time, like three seconds. And if I wanted more, I'm holding for like 20 or 30 seconds to just use the hell out of that muscle. So same principle, different vehicle, but you still travel the same route to get to the same destination. How can I get bigger legs and arms? Is high frequency good for this? Um, hard to say. Remember, it's not so much the frequency, it's the progression. So we come back to that whole thing of, I'm gonna train them every day. Great, if you can train your legs and arms every day, and over the course of two weeks, you're like, I'm doing more reps, I'm doing more weight, my technique is improving, great. It's the progression that gets you those gains. But if after two weeks, you're like struggling to get the same thing and your aches and pains and your knees are shot every time you wake up, too much, too much. You need to recover, which is where you make your progress and you need to have progression in your workouts. So I don't care how hard you're working. That's the thing is people sometimes think, oh, if I do this every day, I'm so exhausted. I'm so tired. My muscles are shot. I'm so uh, like hard, hard uh, soreness and having trouble climbing up stairs. None of that meter matters at all. Because if you can't make progress in your workouts, then you're not actually telling your muscles to change. You're just telling them to somehow survive the onslaught that you're giving them. So focus on your progression and adjust frequency and volume accordingly to make that happen. Goris Fump, what caused your knee issues originally? <laughs> Stupidity. Stupidity and male ignorance, that or an arrogance. Uh, Actually, the real origin was when I was born, my right leg actually was a little deformed. I had a, my foot was out to the side and I had a cast for nine months on my leg. So I've always had a slight external rotation on my right leg habitually and just my muscles have adapted that way. So when I was 13, I started running. And so my gait was a little bit off like this. So I had a little bit of medial stress on my patellar tendon. And one day I was running after about a month of running and boom, and I had pain. I was like, I'm tough. I can run through this and basically just made it way worse thinking that if something hurts, then that's a good thing, which was stupid. And basically that fostered some degree of tendonitis in my knee that lasted until several years ago throughout my entire, entire life. So every lunge, every squat, everything that I ever did had my foot slightly turned out, which meant my hips were slightly askew a little bit. And I had misalignment with stress going through my legs for almost everything I was doing. And finally, when I understood, oh, my hips are weak. Oh, I have some stiffness and my tension alignment, my leg isn't so good. That's when I finally fixed it, <laughs> is learning how to work smarter, not just harder and going through things. Getting when I squeeze my glutes, bridges my hamstrings don't cramp. Absolutely, because the stress isn't pooling in your hamstrings. It's flowing through your hamstrings. So that's a good thing. That's a very good tip. 
you want to keep the muscles associated with the muscles you're working to be uh, engaged as much as possible. Have the tension flow through the chain, up and down. Don't let it flow and then stop. You want to have that flow going on. Let's see here. Do I train neck traps for growth? Um, the neck bridges that I have on the YouTube channel are very good. Just forehead against a weight bench and just uh, hold there. Uh, they're isometric, which is probably better. I know some people are nervous about moving the neck. doesn't need to involve movement at all in order for that. Uh, traps, if you go, uh, go on the YouTube channel and say upper traps, you'll find my latest video that I posted a couple of weeks ago, upper trap and uh, shoulder uh, workout. That will give you some things that you could do, things like face pulls and stuff off of the uh, um, a suspension uh, ropes like the RT-17. Hey, Wolfie, how's it going? Late to the party again? <laughs> yeah, story of my life. I Well, I'm not late to the party. I'm always like, when was the party? Last night. Oh, sure. <laughs> ah, I have a drinking problem. It is hot out here in Colorado, man. I tell you, these Colorado summers are killing me. 50 in Vermont, though. How many hours of training do you advise for older teens per week? No idea. Uh, hard to say, uh, just because, again, it depends on sleep, it depends on habit, diet, uh, how hard you're pushing, how you're pushing, how your proficiency is, is, and stuff. So volume and frequency and stuff, it's always constantly adjusting. There is no set rule. If you're able to keep attacking, growing, and progressing, great. If you're feeling pretty run down, beat up, and you're fading towards the end of the week, cut back a little bit. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Traps from next growth. Always already got that. So opinion on weight vests. They're great. They're like any other tool. It depends on how well you use them, though. Uh, nothing's good or bad. It depends on how well you know how to use it. Always with weight, though, my uh, approach is always heavy technique, light weight. Once the goal is to uh, build weight uh, or lift more weight, it's uh, you're off track. Uh, what was the quote? I read somewhere something something someone said it was the effect of uh, any good measure or any good quantifiable measurement that becomes a goal is no longer a good quantifiable measurement. <laughs> so in the case of like weight, like how many reps can you do? Okay, great. Once that becomes our goal, though, it ceases to become a good measurement of things because we can break down our form. We can use shorter range of motion. Same thing with weight on the best. Like weight on the vest is a quantifiable measurement. It's a factor in the resistance. It doesn't cause it. It's a influence to resistance. But once that becomes the goal, it ceases to become a good measurement. Uh, so we want to use it in a very smart way. Use the vest as a supplement to your training. And uh, refer to Lee and I's uh, chat, uh, the live we did, uh, I think it was a week ago, a little over a week ago for a uh, weight vest training where we talk extensively about that. Let's see. Adim is asking, say about a person doing a 10,000 push-ups every five days a week. I would say, why are you doing so many? Like if you're, if you have that much volume, the intensity can't be there. Uh, the proficiency is going to wane at some degree. I don't know anybody who can do that many and, and uh, improve. Let me tell you this story. Uh, when I was in Taekwondo, uh, in order to test for black belt, uh, we always required a testee to have a cardiovascular challenge. And I did the, the standard one, which was run up and down Mount Mansfield. And one of my friends said, I'm going to do uh, all of my patterns a hundred times in a month. And the pattern is about 20 to 30 moves. It's a set routine where they're going through their techniques. And they're going to do every single one of them. At that point, he had nine, every one of them. So it's 900 patterns. At the end of the month, his patterns were horrible. They were terrible because he had basically deteriorated his technique in order to get the volume in. And then that set as the pattern of his habit. And we had to spend a week doing less in order to bring the intensity and the quality back up. So volume is, is only good if the technique progresses during the volume. So if push-up number 10,000 is better than push-up number one, great. But if it's worse, you're going backwards. You're detraining your body. SPL, is it possible to lose weight without having to resort 
to pulling bands and weights with just calisthenics? Of course, absolutely. Uh, weight loss is a calorie balance equation. It's not at all an exercise equation. Refer to my latest episode of the RDT podcast, which I posted on the YouTube channel, as well as your podcast directories of choice, where I basically say there is nothing about any form of physical training that causes you to lose weight. Now, there's an asterisk to there because there is the theoretical idea that if you do exercise that forces you to handle your body's weight, that may have a subliminal effect in your system that may help you lose weight, but that's still very theoretical. But essentially, when you do exercise, you're conditioning your body uh, to do the exercise. It has nothing to do with weight. You're burning calories. That's the, the objective there. Uh, so that's good. But uh, that's all it is. Is nothing you do will tell your body get leaner because <laughs> the signal, is, as we understand now, just does not exist. Getting in eight to fifteen reps versus fifteen plus reps for muscle. Does it matter or not? Probably doesn't matter too much. Um, more and more of the science is coming out that uh, you can have a very wide range of reps. You can have a very wide range of loads as long as your taking your muscles to a very high state of fatigue, that seems to be the lion's share of stimulus for building muscle. Uh, not the load, not the reps, it's taking the muscle and pushing it really hard. Key point is the muscle though. That's the, the hard part because usually when we reach failure, it depends on where that failure is coming from. We want to make sure it's the muscle that's giving out, not how you feel, not your mind, not you're stopping because you're cardiovascularly worn out, you're tired. There's a million reasons why you may reach failure, but you want to make sure it's the muscle exhaustion that's the cause of it. Brian, good question. How many exercises per workout for an upper lower four times a week split. Well, minimum is one, <laughs> of course, for everything that you're doing, push, pull, and squat. And I'm always a big fan of start with the low number and see what you can get with that. Uh, because usually we tend to err on too much and we dilute the intensity. So start with one for a month, one exercise. And you can change it up every workout. So let's say you have a, a upper lower split. Monday, Tuesday, upper lower, Thursday, Friday, upper lower. So Monday's push would be push-ups. Thursday's push would be dips, for example, right? So try that, one exercise, few hard sets, end it with that. See what happens. Then if you want to add another exercise, I always recommend do an exercise that's different enough to create a more novel stimulus. People are like, I do wide push-ups, and then I do narrow push-ups, and then I do close push-ups. It's like, it's the same exact move. It's not really different enough to elicit a different response. So if you're going to do a different exercise, think like, okay, I am going to do dips, and exercise number one is single dumbbell overhead press, or walking handstands, or something. Make the angle different, make the exercise different, Make it from bilateral to unilateral, go from slow to fast. Make it so different that your body's getting a lot of new information. Because if you're basically doing the same movement pattern a little tiny different, you're not really telling your body anything new. Should I have a strength day and a hypertrophy day? Well, they're kind of one and the same, but it's not a bad idea to change up your repetitions. So you'd have one day where you're going heavier, lower repetitions, another day, lighter, medium to higher repetitions. A very classic way to go about things. I think it's good for injury prevention. It's good for getting from preventing things to go stale. That is, of course, if you don't have a real preference of one or the other. So if you are like, I'm hell bent on getting as strong as possible, I would focus on the strength style training for the most part. Ditto on the other way around. But yeah, definitely going with back and forth is a good way. So I did push-ups. My chest is burning a lot. Is that close to fit? It's close. It's, it's really close. Um, you want to feel the muscle burning. You want to feel it working, of course. Uh, but uh, it's hard to say how close you are because, again, it, you, can, you may feel like you're at your wit's end and you still have five reps in the tank, at least. Um, it's, it takes experience. It takes experience to know where that line is. It's, it's easy to fool ourselves into thinking we know where failure is. 
Theoretically, is it true that horizontal pulling gives you a healthier back than vertical? Yeah, theoretically. A lot of it depends very much on scapular retraction because a lot of times when we do vertical pulling, we oftentimes do so with a rounded shoulder. So that's why in one of my videos I talked about one of the biggest mistakes people make with pull-ups is they reach like not up but forward. The pull-up bar is in front of them. So their shoulders are uh, protracted and they, they start doing pull-ups and they're all hunched up. If you can get your shoulders to retract with vertical, it should have roughly the same effect. Uh, but usually people have an easier time with horizontal pulls, getting those shoulders back, depressing the shoulder blades down, having a better result. So very good question. Very, very, very good. All right. What do you think of nucleus overload theory? I training at muscle at least five days a week. It's fine if you can still get that recovery in. Again, it, we, we don't want to get too consumed with the idea of working a muscle hard. It's, it's the same idea in, in weight loss where people get so consumed with the idea of fat. They're like, how do you burn fat? This burns fat. This food stores fat. Burn fat, store fat. There are two things that actually are meaningless because it all depends on, well, are you burning and and storing at different rates of speed. It's the balance between the two. So you can do anything to your muscle and it's great if you can progress it over time, if you can give yourself the ability to recover and progress. If you're working as hard as possible and you're not progressing your performance, nothing works. So, and it's, and it's gonna be so independent for different people like that. The theory could work great, but only if on day five, you're performing better than on day one or at least on par on day one. But if on day one you're here, day two, day three, day four, day five, you're just working yourself harder, but you're thinking, I'm working so hard, my muscles are burning, they're, they're so fatigued, they're exhausted, I'm so sore. So what? <laughs> None of that is a stimulus for building muscle and strength because what is a stimulus is saying, muscle, I need you to be able to do 50 push-ups. And then uh, the next day, if you're like, I did 40 push-ups, you didn't tell your body to do anything. <laughs> you didn't tell it to do anything new. You just said do 40 push-ups because that's all you can do now and you're just beating your head against the wall. So it's it's gonna take some trial and error, but don't let hard work be your objective. Let progression be your objective. And if you're making progress, if your ability to do the exercise is improving, then it's working. It's gonna be producing the results you want. Should I prioritize frequency? And get less intensity for more volume up or intensity but less volume if you want to optimize muscle growth and strength you know it may not matter very much either way um who knows uh at this point to be honest with you i don't really know because a lot of the older science used to say that as long as volume's the same however you do the exercise probably doesn't matter too much now it's going a little more towards the theory of make sure your mu muscles are working pretty hard i would say if either way at the end of a workout or the week, your muscles are still hitting that level of exertion and fatigue, you're probably gonna have the same result either way. I would say choose the one that's more likely to best fit your schedule and your lifestyle. Which one is the easiest for you to maintain? Uh, and that way you can make sure that you have the better chance of progressing those. Deem asking once again, was the purpose of building external obliques apart from aesthetics? Uh, lots of things. They play a very big role in stabilization, especially with horizontal work, levers, push-ups, um, planks, that sort of thing. Uh, they play a very big role for that. There's a lot of twisting motion. There's a lot of body control. They also play a very big role in total body stability when you're upright. So if you're carrying objects, especially unilaterally on one side, there's a lot involved with that as well. So they're very, very functional uh, for total body and core stability uh, on, on the whole. Let's see. Got one on, where was it? Where was it? Very good one on motivation. Oh, real quick, Bobby. Soreness is not always gain, right? Absolutely, Bobby. Uh, soreness is... Coral is, it, here's, the, here's the thing I learned the other day, is soreness comes from a novel stimulus. Growth comes from an effective stimulus. So you can get sore doing anything that's just different. And uh, I remember one time uh, I used to have a very effective and potent core routine. It took me like 15 minutes to go through. And then one day I went out with a friend of mine and we went to the driving range. And the next day my abs were sore. 
because we just hit golf balls. And I was like, so should I go to the driving range as part of my core routine? No, you get sore just because you do something different. Your body's like, oh, this is new. Uh, so soreness usually is an indicator that you kind of stepped up. So that's okay. It's good. Enjoy it. But don't take it as a sign that it was effective. And don't take a lack of it to, as a sign that it wasn't effective. Uh, Omar asking, I heard the military trains five times a week. Hell if I know. I've never been in the military. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've heard stories about guys are just crazy. Like, you know, you always wonder if it's urban legend. My my dad served in the Navy and he used to tell us about how the SEALs, I mean, they'd wake them up at 3 a.m., helicopter them offshore, like three miles, drop them in the middle of the ocean. They can't even see land. And they're like, all right, swim back for breakfast. And it's like, God, the, the thing is those, those guys could do is insane. Uh, and I would say, if anything, of course it's not true. They're probably training seven days a week. Um, a lot of volume, but always remember too, that a lot of the physical training they do in the military, especially the hardest stuff right at the, the uh, get-go, isn't to train the body, it's to train the mind. They're trying to train people to go beyond what they think is capable of. So that way when shit really goes down and they think they're at their limit, they know that more is there. So a lot of times people will say, oh, the Navy SEALs train this way and they do this. It's not about physical health and training to a large degree. It's about changing this. It's even about changing this to a, a large degree as well. So, um, there, I mean, it's inspirational, but it's not always the best for health and wellness practices for us civilians. It's, it's a different application. You're training for different purposes. That's as far as I know about that. I could be totally wrong. Who knows? I, I've never been in the military, but that's what I've picked up over the years as, a, as an approach. Uh, does the plank build or just strengthen the core? It does both. You can't have one without the other to a degree, but uh, it will definitely help with both, of course. Um, it's also one of those things that uh, I always advocate going for intensity. Use a suspension trainer. Any plank that you can hold for more than 30 seconds is too easy. Uh, people are like, I can hold a plank for 10 minutes. Again, it's like the 10,000 push-up. Why? <laughs> it's not very intense. Why go at such a low intense level? Uh, I wouldn't go to a gym and be like, guys, I can do 100 bench presses. And they're like, yeah, with an empty bar, la di frickin' da. And I'm like, yeah, but it's 100 bench presses. Like, add some weight. Give yourself some challenge. Same exact attitude. You want the intensity there. There we go. Flynn, tips for motivation up. Yes, always remember, motivation is a simple formula. It is not about so much uh, motivation. Well, motivation is all about how we feel about what we're doing. So once again, it's all emotional. But the formula for motivation is cost-to-benefit analysis. It's like economics class, right? You have the cost to doing something, time, energy, money, effort, right? Maybe there's an emotional cost to it, like you feel really uncomfortable going into a gym, there's a high cost. And the reward, and that can be strength, uh, weight loss, emotional payoff, mental payoff, like, oh, I just feel so much better after a run kind of thing. So motivation is dipping usually when our balance is high cost, low reward. When we have a loss of motivation, we should listen to that because that's our internal clock telling us it ain't worth it, what you're doing. It's not worth the effort. You're not getting enough value for it. So in order to flip it back, don't watch like YouTube videos with like fancy music and like, you can do it and this is your hour and no. No, like that gets you feeling better, but it doesn't change the equation. So therefore it doesn't give you actual long-term solution. The best thing you can do is decrease the cost and or increase the benefit. So if you have something that is low cost, high benefit, your motivation for it will always be high. And that's why Red Delta Project is always about get the cost really low, get the benefit really high. And if you can do that, the motivation will be there to continue practicing those things. Low cost, high reward, high motivation. Leg raises enough to build an aesthetic strong core. Absolutely. Leg raise is one of the most complete core exercises you could possibly do. And there's a lot more to them than people realize. Um, the biggest tip I can give you is stabilize the hell out of your back. It should be just as much of a back exercise as anything else and slow it down. A lot of people do leg raises like this. 
do it like that. Very smooth, controlled, and get as much range as possible. Uh, again, intensity is what you're looking for. If you can do more than 10 repetitions, make it harder. <laughs> Often again, you train form extensors with calisthenics every day. They recover very, very quickly. I've been training my extensors every single day for several weeks, been great. Uh, particularly with an overcoming isometric where I just pull my fingers back as hard as I can. Uh, very, very uh, potent. If you have uh, soreness and it's really feeling like it's hurting or something, then back off. But my experience is the forearms, they're like a lot of things. They just can handle a ton of volume because we do this all day and we do this and we do this and we use our hands all the time. Why do you think some prisoners so jacks the one that don't sneak sneak steroids in. Uh, I'm guessing, again, never been in the military, never been incarcerated. But um, the thing is, if you ever wanted to give yourself the optimal environment to get in shape, it'd be in a prison. <laughs> Think about it. Every aspect of your life is controlled. So your sleep is on point. Your diet is on point. Your rest and recreation on point. You've got a ton of time. You can get plenty of sleep and, and rest. Um, that's why back in the day, they used to do a lot of scientific research on convicts. Now it's illegal, naturally, uh, but it's because, hey, we've got a whole population of people we can control 24 seven, this is great. So that's one of the biggest things right there is just that. But you also have to, uh, once again, consider the emotional factor. I mean, you've got guys in there, a lot of aggression, a lot of pent up emotions, a uh, lot of desire to be tough, a lot of need to be tough and intimidating. So you combine all of that together and you've got one hell of a formula to be insanely strong and jacked and change your body in very, very big ways. Meanwhile, guys like us, it's like, oh, my day, whatever, you know, I'll get to bed whenever. And it'd be kind of neat to have abs. Wouldn't that be cool? I'd look good in the beach. I mean, we can't hold a candle to that. It's not even close to the same ball of, ball of wax. What's up, Wolfie? Do you get days where you lack strength? What do you do to overcome it? I get days like make me feel lousy. Keep up the great work. Thank you very much, Wolfie. So lacking strength, I mean, so much of it is mental and emotional too. I and mean, we've all experienced this where you feel differently about something and suddenly you get stronger. Um, some days you're just off. And so on days when I'm lacking strength, what I'll usually do is and I'll incorporate some overcoming isometrics into my dynamic sets. So I'll go back and forth. And that usually helps me to tap into a little bit more of just the neural side of recruiting the muscle more. Um, that sometimes works, but if it's an emotional thing, like I'm really stressed out about something, it's just, it's not going to be there. So get what you can, don't beat yourself up over it and regress a little bit. Do it for the sake of stress relief. If you are stressed, feel good, work on technique or maybe an, a technique you haven't done in a while. So if you're off and you're like, oh, I just cannot get these archer pushups today. Okay. Maybe RTO pushups on the wings. Yeah. I haven't done those in a while. Okay, great. It's just something different. Be playful with the workout, have fun with it. Don't worry too much about your structure, have fun, relieve stress. And that'll probably be the best use of that sort of scenario. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Any benefit to contracting all your muscles in an exercise? Yeah, I mean, it's tension control. It's flexing. It's very therapeutic, uh, good for blood pressure, provided you're breathing, and make sure that uh, you have tension flowing throughout your whole body. But yeah, it's very, very good for you uh, to do from time to time. How much time do I spend training each day? Ah, oh, boy, it can really vary, and it's hard to say because I break it up so much throughout the day as well. But I would probably say on average about 20 minutes, maybe. You know, some days I'm just feeling really good, feeling my oats, and I'm like, ah, oh, I'm going to be on this playground workout for a good solid hour. But uh, I would say on average probably 20 to 30 minutes, if that. Uh, next one, how to add direct ab training into a weekly schedule. Leg raises or stretch out planks, those are my two favorites. Uh, just fit them in wherever wherever you like. Uh, they are good warm-up exercises to a large degree too. So sometimes in the beginning of the workout feels pretty good, especially if uh, uh, you're about to do pull-ups or push-ups uh, because the stretch outs uh, will involve your arms, your chest, your back. Same with the hanging leg raises. So in the beginning, but wherever you can fit them, it's probably uh, fine. So once again, our 
has flown right by. Uh, this is uh, always so much fun for me to do. Thank you, everybody, for attending a little live session here. Appreciate it. But remember the lesson that I started off with is that what you know isn't that important if it doesn't change how you feel. And beware of those who are trying to make you feel bad about something, someone else, something else get you to go against something, get positive. You cannot build a positive result when you're coming from a negative place. So I'll do this again uh, in the near future. Once again, don't forget, check out my latest edition of the RDP podcast where I talk about micro workout strategies for burning fat and weight control. One of the most game changing uh, episodes that I came out with in a long while. So you can check that here on YouTube or on your uh, podcast directory of choice. So thanks everybody, appreciate it. Talk to you later, be fit, live free.